Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Tele I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and today we have a really interesting uh, and I think really unique uh, hangout plan for you today because uh, we're going to be talking about modeling the universe using 3D printers, and we've got people using Hubble data and other astronomical data sources to create these really cool uh, objects from 3D printers, and they're using them for all kinds of different things. Uh, for example, they're using them for uh, helping to educate the visually impaired, but they're also using, they're also finding things out about these objects, about the various astronomical objects uh, in the printers that we may not be able to ordinarily see from the um, from just the 3D renderings of the images themselves. So really interesting stuff planned. I got a lot of people here from both the Institute and NASA Goddard, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. But before I do, let me tell you how to interact with us. The easiest way is to hit the Q&A app on the on the uh, event page or on the video that you're watching. Send us a question or a comment. I'll read them out as the as the hangout progresses. Alternatively, you can comment on the YouTube page. I'm looking at those comments as well. You could use the G Plus event page, and last and not and but not least, although it is least because nobody ever seems to do it, please tweet at us using the hashtag Hubble Hangout, and we will. All, I'm also looking at those right now. So if you have a question or comment you'd like to send on Twitter, please do it that way. So with me today is, as she always is every single week, Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute. But now, while she ordinarily helps me moderate these things. Today she's going to be more of a guest because she's part of the project that we're going to highlight today. Hi, Carol. And don't forget that we, we have her muted, so she's going to be muting and unmuting throughout the whole thing. They would mostly like me to be quiet. So. <laughs> yes, we try as hard as we can, mostly but we're not always very successful. Mute, so. <laughs> we're not always very successful in muting. Also with, with us today is Dr. Antonella Nota. She's also uh, at the Institute, but I, I see that you also work at, uh, at ESA, right? The European Space Agency, is that right? Yes, I'm part of the international contingent of you know, Right, there are uh, some people within the institute yes. from ESA working on Hubble. So, welcome, welcome, Hi. and she's also part. Of Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, and joining us also is uh, 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 Thomas uh, Madera, I believe is the last name. Is where did Madera? your where did third go? Uh, did yeah, that's weird. <laughs> it should be showing, but it's not showing. It says it's on. Oh, okay. All right. He's also from NASA Goddard, part of the 3D printing project. Uh, welcome, as well as uh, Frank Reddy, from the, also from NASA Goddard. Uh, he's a science writer, and um, I should mention Tom is also an astrophysicist. It's not up there on his lower third, but it, it, or it is up on his lower third, but his lower third is not up. So, anyway, welcome, guys. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. I think I'd like to start with you, Carol. Can you give us a sort of overview of the 3D printing project? What are you guys uh, What are you guys doing? What are you hoping to accomplish? Things like that. Sure. Um, so our project, which is called 3D Astronomy. I mean, I meant 3D Astronomy. I said 3D. 3D Astronomy is based on Hubble Space, specifically Hubble Space Telescope data, and um, we, as many people know, we have a very large education outreach program associated with the Hubble Space Telescope, but there are some groups of people that um, we can't reach easily. And so we've been thinking about and starting to work on a, a, a suite of products that for the visually impaired, and, but also are beneficial for people who learn in different ways. And so we have been thinking about the beautiful images from HST and how can we share those with the visually impaired. And we have, we have collaborators who have done some work in making tactile imagery so that people can understand the complexity and beauty of Hubble Space Telescope images and then also understanding the underlying science. And so that's basically the idea was to use 3D printing to create tactile models that people can use their fingers to explore imagery rather than um, using their eyes. And so our challenge is to try to represent the complexity of the images. And if you don't mind, I was going to show an image. And actually, Antonella, who's the science PI of this project, might be able to explain some of the com complexity of our prototype image, if yes. that's OK. No, that is fine. But before we start, I just want to okay. I want to I want to have uh, the, the the NASA Goddard uh, folks yeah, tell sure. us a little bit, of, introduce the, their stuff sure. a little bit. Uh, Tom, Absolutely. can you give us a little 
what can you add anything to that? What are you guys doing at Goddard that maybe parallels or, or augments what, what Carol was just saying? Yes, so uh, here at Goddard, the, our first project actually did not use uh, Hubble data. Um, we used data from the uh, Very Large Telescope in Chile. And the thing that we modeled was the, uh, the Eta Carina homunculus nebula. And okay. Um, okay. this is just a, a 3D, 3D print model of that. And we okay. had a uh, press release come out. But we also are working on some, uh, some HST data but that is um, that is some work work in progress at the moment. Okay, so uh, so both of you, both of your groups, it sounds like you're trying to get people to visualize data in a slightly different way. We're getting away from images a little bit using these technologies. Uh, Carol, um, so I'm going to go ahead and just give a quick cutaway to the printer that's working in your office. If you look okay. behind, if you look behind Carol over her shoulder, you can see there's this arm moving back and forth, and here's a close up of it. Here's the 3D printer uh, working right now, and right now you're printing something out, right, Carol? Right now, yes, we're actually printing a 3D galaxy, um, which is our second phase of our, our project, um, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, <laughs> we thought we might talk a little bit about where we started, which was yep. to make um, texture maps and elevation maps of star clusters, and, and Antonella okay. actually has some of those products. I can show the image and then she can she can talk about it because okay. she's an expert at that. Okay, so I'm gonna try to screen share here, folks. Let's see. Yeah, there's a little. So let me know if we are sharing. We should be sharing now. Yep, we see. And then I will bring in the image so that everybody can see the image. So there it is. Ah, NGC 602. So Antonella can talk about this. Well, this is, this is NGC 602, which is a beautiful cluster in the small Magellanic Cloud. And uh, when we saw this image, we thought this is a great image to convey the basic science behind our cluster form and evolve. And so just to think how to explain this image to people who cannot appreciate the beauty, uh, we thought to distill a couple of messages. What are the things that the fundamental concept that we want to convey, right? There is a star cluster at the center, just newly formed, and the star cluster has very massive stars, and the massive stars are swept away, the cocoon of gas and dust, and you can still see the filaments around, in this sort of uh, bubble-shaped shell, and you can see small stars still forming. Around so, this is a region, dense in gas and dust, with stars at the center and stuff, a new star forming in the surrounding. So, if we have to think how you convey these messages to people who cannot see, right? Uh, traditionally, the work was done with embossed print. So, this image would be used to generate a printout which had embossed features, so that people could touch it and recognize the various, and you can see the example, Carol has just pulled the example of a embossed form exactly for NGC 602. So, okay, so wait a second, what, Carol's showing something here, what is this now? So this is, uh, this is a, a way for you to understand how our process works. So, you know, when you're talking to a blind person, they have to feel their way through the astronomical object. So the traditional way the way before 3D printers was that you would produce something like the sheet that you can see, where uh, the printer okay. embosses the features, and you associate very textures with the features. So if we can see the picture again, you see the circles are stars, and the vertical lines are dust, and the dotted the pattern is dust, and so people would put their hands on, uh, on that sheet and identify the features. Now, with the 3D printers, we have taken it one step further and we have created 3D printouts exactly of the same sort of concept. And maybe Carol can put one up, I can show you one here, you can probably see. So that's, that's so the uh, 3D texture map you were just showing us. Right, exactly of the same star cluster. So you can see the cluster here at the center. You can see the areas of dust and gas. And they are all characterized by different textures. So people 
people who can't see can put their hands on this printout and, and basically build a mental image of the object. So the, this was step number one. Step number two is basically capturing the intensity of the various features. And so this now, we call this elevation map. And the elevation map is basically for at every point, it has a depth, a height, that is exactly related to the intensity of the image. So people can understand how brightest are the stars than the gas, or what's the relative intensity of the gas and dust. So and so the first map was what was you could tell with the different whether something was gas or dust, whether something was a star, whether something well, you know what they were, and the second thing you showed was how bright they were. Yes, exactly. Yes. And what when we did our testing, we found very interesting that um, people who were blind from birth and had learned how to use tactile materials, including Braille could go straight to the elevation map. And so they could use intensity plus texture. So it's like if you, you know, when you, if you are sighted, you look at a visual image and you understand there are different colors, but there's also brightness. And you get that right away. And so people who were blind from birth or blind very early on could tell that right away. People who were losing their sight or were partially visually impaired they needed to feel the textures first and understand the overall structure. And once they got that in their head, then they could move to the elevation map and then say, oh, these are stars. They're much brighter than the dust. Oh, here's the dust. Here's the gas. So they needed a two-step process where lots of... So it was very interesting that different people who learn in different ways needed different products. Ah, okay. So, uh, Tom Adair uh, from Goddard, uh, do you was that your motivation for starting to do some printing on this too? Was to help visually impaired, or did you have other other things in mind? I think part of the initial project actually was um, to uh, help with the visually impaired, but another part was just to be able to see parts of a astrophysical object that we normally cannot visualize. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we do are is the, the geometry is intrinsically three-dimensional, and you don't always get all of the information about an object just from a two-dimensional image. So the project was originally designed for doing um, planetary nebulae, but the uh, the physics and the methods involved are directly applicable to the to what we were doing with Ada Karina. And so we asked um, our collaborator, Wolfgang Stefan, who's at uh, UNAM in Baja, California, Mexico, if he, would take his, um, if he would take his code that was originally designed for modeling planetary nebula and extend it to modeling uh, Eta Carina. And okay. he also, he has a big project, and one of his main motivations is to do modeling uh, for, for the visually impaired. Okay, so the, the so let's get to Ada Karina. Ada Karina is uh, the object you guys started with, and uh, Frank is showing something on his screen. Uh, Frank, you want to describe what you're showing us here? Can you hear? You're muted. That's, there you go. Sure, that's the uh, that's the digital model uh, uh, actually on my uh, printer. Uh, before you would go to print, you would bring the model into uh, the digital model into software and where it gets sliced into layers, and this is what you would see if you were using my printer and this model. Okay, this is an astronomy-themed hangout, uh, and we have an astrophysicist. Tom, tell us what Ada Carina is before we go any further. Uh, sure, Frank, <laughs> could you have Carl put up uh, your image of, of Ada Carina? Yeah. So uh, while, while we're getting the image up, I'll uh, give a... Okay, there so here's, uh, here's the image. Yep. So the thing that you notice right away is that uh, Eta Carina has a very specific geometry. Um, it's, it's a bipolar nebula. And what makes Eta Carina uh, special is, is it's one of the uh, most evolved uh, and most massive stars in our galaxy. And it's also relatively close, and it's very bright, which means that we can study it in, uh, in, in great detail. And in the mid-1800s, um, Eta Carina had a very um, powerful outburst. It was almost as powerful as a supernova explosion. Before then, everyone thought it was just a normal 
regular star in the sky, and actually you could barely even see it with the naked eye. But then it had this eruption, and it became the second brightest uh, non-solar system object in the sky. And it was during this time that um, it ejected all this material that forms this nebula. But it was not a supernova. No, it was not a supernova. That's, what's, that's what makes uh, Eta Carina so uh, fascinating is that, well, now we know that it's actually two stars. We know now that at the very, very center of this nebula are two very massive stars. And total, the total mass of this system is about uh, 120 times the mass of our sun. And the brightness of this thing is about 5 million times the brightness of our sun. But again, what's amazing is, is it ejected this gigantic nebula, and the mass in the nebula itself is at least probably between 10 and 40 solar masses, or 40 times the mass of our sun. But wow. the, star, the star wasn't destroyed in this explosion, and, and we, have no, we have no idea how this, is, how this is possible, whether it was an explosion from a single star or whether two stars collided or whether two stars merged together. I know and it's an amazing looking object and Hubble's got some awesome images uh, of this thing but one of the things that I I guess I'm I look at this in this picture here and how you, there's a 3D model of this thing how do you know what like it, even on the right side of here it says model side facing away from earth how do you get that information I mean all we're seeing is you know a, a one or a 2D uh, projection of this uh, of this object how do you get the 3D Data points that you need to make it to make this accurate. Yeah, so this was this was part of a uh, a very intense observing program, and like I said, it was done with a uh, with a telescope. And uh, so Eta Carina is in the uh, is in a constellation in the in the southern sky. So unfortunately, you can't see it from from the northern sky. Good so we had to use that. a uh, so we had to use a, a telescope in Chile, and we used an instrument that is called uh, X Shooter, and it's a spectrograph. So the the light. Uh, passes through a, a slit and it disperses that light and that gives us not only spatial information along uh, one dimension of the slit but it also gives us velocity information and what we did is we used this instrument to map the entire homunculus nebula and uh, we used a very specific emission line we used uh, we didn't do this in optical light so the image that that is being displayed is uh, is a Hubble image, so it's 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 optical, but we used uh, emission from hydrogen at, that's emitted in near uh, infrared wavelengths. And the thing that's uh, good about the near infrared is that allows us to see uh, through, essentially almost see through the nebula, and we can actually uh, see the back side of that of that lobe that's pointing away from us, and we can get information. About that, about the structure that's expand, expanding away from us. Awesome. And that's, based that's on awesome. based on all of this, all of, when we get all of this data and then we model it, we can uh, we can construct our our three D model. Great. Okay. So, uh, Carol, um, you guys you guys said that you guys started with these uh, texture maps and and these luminosity maps uh, with the uh, with that one star forming region that you just that we just saw. Uh, has that been used um, in in classrooms yet, or are, are, what's the uh, what's the plan? You're you're muted, unfortunately. Thank there you. you so our strategy has been to use the first uh, cluster NGC 602 to test it. Actually, we decided to test it with some t uh, small focus groups who were visually impaired at different levels and who have some or sometimes even no experience with tactile materials and also had a range of education. And the reason was that we wanted to get a wide diversity of user to refine the textures. Um, and we actually had to refine the texture several times because what we thought were good textures and what we thought were good textures on the paper, the, 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 the swell form paper which has the raised surface which we talked about first. It worked for the paper but it didn't really work for the 3D print so we had to modify that and also the the people who gave us feedback traditionally a lot of tactile stuff is done with like straight lines and slanted lines and dots and stuff like that and so we had to make sure that we could distinguish the stars 
from other dotted surfaces, and then the users wanted us to do something that was evocative of dust or gas. So we had to think about textures. So it's taken us a while to refine the texture. So we didn't think we should take it to the classroom before. I mean, there's no point in taking a product to a classroom when you're not really sure that the product even works. Right. So we're trying to do proof of concept, and then what we're going to do is we're going to create a process so that we can basically manufacture elevation maps and, and texture maps for many Hubble images. So we'll have a library of those and people can print those. Um, and then the next step is actually what is being printed now is that we, we also have a galaxy project and we have these, we're making 3D models of galaxies now and they are also textured using our preferred textures there are star clusters, um, there's gas and dust. And Point it just a little bit more towards your window so we can get the light from the okay. window. Angle Sorry, it like that. my Perfect. only desk lamp is, is on the printer. No, that's good. That's, that's better. That, that's, that better? Yeah, but now, okay. now kind of angle it toward. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. Oh, no, no, that's good. I just wanted to be able, okay, I wanted yeah. people to be able, it was saturated there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Hey, I can so. show you the black one, which is even worse. <laughs> so those are galaxies. Those are galaxies. So these are galaxies. And I, ha I have to agree. Um, with the, uh, our Goddard uh, colleagues, that we we are doing we are doing this for the visually impaired to you know convey science and all this stuff. But when you print this stuff and you start looking at it, you're like, oh, oh. So we're learning things as well. And I I, I think um, uh, Th Thomas and and Frank have verbalized that as well. Is that you start printing these things and you start learning things about the astronomical object as well. What you did, you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. So, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, know, we knew in our heads that it had wide applicability, not just for the visually impaired, but it really, it, even scientists can learn something by printing something in 3D. Oh, great. Well, Frank, I promise I'm going to get you in on this in just a sec, I, but I want to ask, I want to go, what, I want to reinforce a little bit of what Carol just, the point she just made with Tom. Tom, uh, apparently, uh, I think there was, there were things you learned about Adakar that you didn't know by just looking, once you had the printouts, is that correct? Was there, there was some, actually some scientific uh, insight from printing these things out. Yes, so uh, here I'll, I'll use this, our, our biggest print model of, of the nebula, and uh, it's, it's, <laughs> wow. it's, it's color-coded for a reason, so the, the red lobe is the lobe that is pointing um, away from the Earth, so it's the lobe that's, that's receding, and yeah. the blue lobe red, is... Red shifting away, sort of, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly right. And then the blue lobe is the lobe that's in the, in the foreground of the HST image, so it's the lobe that's coming towards us, and... Uh, we actually discovered some new features that, that were previously unknown to exist in the Adakar, in the Adakar Nebula. The, the first are these protrusions that you see um, jutting out of, of the lobes. There's one from, from, the, from the bottom blue lobe and one from the top lobe. And then there are these, uh, hopefully they'll show up well on the, on the webcam, but there are these trenches. Yeah, we can see them. Yeah. That, that are there's one on the again there's one on the foreground lobe, and there's one on the receding lobe. And what's what's interesting is that uh, and those are real. Those are real. Yes, these features. these are real physical real physical features in the nebula itself, and um, some some really interesting things. So for instance, the uh, the the protrusions are not visible, or at least they're not they're not uh, clearly apparent in in for instance the Hubble image, but you see them in this uh, in this molecular hydrogen line that that we observed, and then also the the trenches. You can see one in in the bottom of the uh, in the bottom lobe in the Hubble image, but the one on the far side of the lobe on on this on this lobe that's pointing away from us, we did not know that that existed until we 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 did the the 3D modeling. Okay. Wow, that's so. Are you as an astrophysicist? Are you excited about this new uh, insight into some of these? I mean, let's say you printed some other things out. I mean, uh, their chances are pretty good. You might glean other insights from things. That yes, you we out. are, and um, I, I, I'm not going to say too much now. But we are working on something that is uh, something new that we are doing with 3D printing that, as far as we know, has never been done before, and we have potentially discovered something new. 
and we're hoping to make a, possibly make an announcement in the in the near future about that. Sounds like another hangout's on the way here soon. Cool. Well, let us know, Frank. Let us let me get. I want to finally get you. I'm sorry, uh, it's taken me a bit, but uh, I wanted to get through some of the intros and stuff. And uh, you're a science writer at Goddard, and you're you're involved in uh, the 3D printing project. Uh, why don't you give us a little? What what's your what are you uh, what are you excited about? What are you working on with this? Well, principally, I'm involved uh, as a hobbyist. I, I had gotten involved uh, a couple of months before the uh, Ada Karina material uh, appeared in my office, uh, and uh, th there were efforts to try to use a uh, an older 3D printer that we had at Goddard, um, and I took a stab at doing it on my home printer, and we wound up making uh, something like 100 of these things, uh, a little homunculi, <laughs> uh, these were just homunculi. What a great word! I'm going to start using that. For, I worked that into a sentence. Homunculi. Uh, I, I printed up uh, probably about a hundred of these. We distributed some to the co-authors of the paper that Tom was on, and uh, to uh, another couple of dozen to uh, people who were participating in a NASA social at Goddard. Uh, and so uh, it was really a, a, a trial by fire to uh, to get all that done. But uh, uh, it was a real learning experience for me. Um, as I said, I got into it uh, just out of curiosity, um, but uh, and because you want and you bought one of the and you owned a printer, so you did. Well, I, so, what, can, can you tell us a little bit about the technology? I'm going to have Carol's printer up here, and how do these things work? Well, tell us a little bit about the technology here. Well, there are a number of different technologies, but the one that's becoming affordable very quickly is the fused filament fabrication, which takes a um, a roll of uh, plastic filament and uh, sort of uh, places it down the way you would ice a cake, uh, just drawing the outline of the object. Uh, software goes through and slices that object into uh, small layers, and the printer simply draws each layer in succession and gradually builds up the object. And uh, uh, Carol, you said you were printing out what happened? Ah, oh, there you go. She, oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, please show that. Yeah, Carol's showing the material, a spool of some kind. Uh, what is that stuff, Frank? Uh, it's it's probably ABS, plastic. Uh, it's also PLA. Which You're muted, Carol. Oh, okay. Okay. I couldn't see the label. Um, but <laughs> right, PLA. <laughs> these are the two common, uh, common filaments. They're, they're Others, nylon is also one. So that stuff gets spooled through the printer head, which we're seeing right now go back and forth. And right. there's also a third dimension we don't see as well, which is coming at us and back away from us uh, in the plane of the camera. So, And the printer, at the tip of the printer is a, is a heater, and the uh, filament is heated to 100 degrees C and dribbled out uh, very, very precisely uh, as the head moves across. And Carol, this thing is ubiquitous in your office. We've had the, every almost every hangout. Somebody has commented, "What's that going on behind Carol?" Uh, yeah. You're always printing something on it. How long right. does it take usually to make an? Uh, you're printing out a galaxy. You said right now, right? Right. I'm gonna let Antonella talk oh. about the time it takes oh. <laughs> and what it's involved. Okay. All right, time. go ahead, Antonella. A Hubble time. It takes approximately hours to to print half of the galaxy. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we realized with the testing with our group of uh, visually impaired is that the larger format helps them to recognize the features. So one of the limitations of the MakerBot, which is the low-end printer we are using, is that the format is small. So we are building our prototypes in pieces, and then we glue them so we can make a larger format, because we know that that is easy. Uh, but the reason why we chose the MakerBot in our case is because it is affordable. And so, you know, you would think that schools can reasonably purchase something like that, libraries. And so one of our long-term goals is actually making a library of images uh, and make them available to people so that actually people can take them and... Uh, and print them in their own, you know, printer at home or at school or in the library, and, and kind of experience. 
Yeah. What are we talking about here as far as cost? Couple grand, four, you know, five thousand. What are we talking here? Couple of thousand. Couple of grand. Okay, so you're right. That could be uh, in the realm of possibility for a lot of schools. Is there any plans for maybe uh, distributing? I, I don't know. How, how does this thing know what to print? What do you send it? Do you send it a file of some kind, a 3D file, or what do you do? Yes. These printers read a very specific format, which is called STL. So part of the process is to convert the images as we know them, or the model, whatever, into an STL format. Then a 3D printer, any 3D printer, can take and print. Uh, oh. So it's a pretty standard format used by all printers. Carol, do you have a finished thing of what you're printing right now? Do you yeah, have Yeah, actually I'm printing um, yes, we have the we have two test galaxies, uh, 3344 and uh, 1566 I think. And the black one that I have here, we are we are printing a, a purple version of that one. Um, and then uh, we have a programmer who's working on some more of the galaxies and the interface, and we're going to start printing um, more of those. I, I actually want to have the texture and elevation map of this galaxy as well, so that we have the three products, so that we can test the three products and okay. see whether people prefer just this or whether they would like to use the other ones to kind of teach themselves about the science. So we're, we're thinking about what are the different formats that work with what kind of users best. Wow, this is like totally cutting edge stuff here. So Frank, when you did your when your initial printing, uh, what did you print out? Did you print on astronomy things, or was it something? What what else did you print? Uh, my initial uh, uh, efforts were to print spare parts uh, or replacement parts for my kitchen drawers. <laughs> So you definitely being pragmatic. Those were expensive parts, though, weren't they? <laughs> they existent I can't. You can't buy them anywhere because the, the, the furniture is so old. So. Oh, okay. So for yeah. irreplaceable parts, you can't just go to Lowe's and get them. You print them out yourself. Uh, so I, I know that this the the primary focus, educationally at least, is for the visually impaired. Uh, but for someone, you know, for 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 those of us uh, who can see these models, one of one of the things that strikes me is it would be really cool if if we could do different colors. Is that possible, uh, Frank? Oh, absolutely. Uh, different colors in one in the same print. Yeah. Is that possible? So what do you do? Switch out the spool, or what do you do? You, there are uh, uh, there, there are printers that have multiple extruders, and therefore you can do as many colors as you have extruders. Uh, okay. the, the printer, the printer hot end. There, there is in fact one, one, one uh, printer head that contains four extruders. Uh, strangely and interestingly named the Kraken. Uh, Kraken. <laughs> but uh, you could, that's one, one way to do it. It would be to uh, uh, have four colors printed simultaneously. You know what this reminds me of? I, I'm I'm, an, I'm I'm really dating myself here, but my first computer had a printer, an Epson MX80, and when you when you printed on it, it made this horrendous racket, and it would go back and forth in one color uh, only, and it would take you like minutes to print a page of text. It's a really uh, a similar experience. I would <laughs> yeah. say. So when I look at this thing go, I have to say I'm kind of reminded of those days where we've got this dot matrix printer going back and forth, and then Frank was just telling us about the Kraken, which can has color. And I don't know if you remember when color came out, Carol, <laughs> but it was a big deal. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of like mimicking uh, that sort of technology curve, at least in my mind. That's what I'm so happily, it will only get better from here. That's what I yes. hear. Yes, and, and like printers today, are, uh, although printers more or less now are kind of obsolete. I don't think we use them very much anymore. I don't. I, I only own a printer because I sometimes have to print, but very rarely. Uh, okay, so I want to I talk a little bit about um, the uh, uh, going from data to the printer. Um, I'm not quite sure the best person to ask, but I'm thinking, Carol, but maybe it's Frank. I, you got data, or maybe it's even Tom, and I'm just going to let one of you, or, or Antonella, I'll let you just chime in if you know this. It's but, actually, for our group, it's Antonella. It's she Antonella. Knows. Okay, yes. good. She, let me, she, let me, she trained a student to do this, too, then, and she's training a programmer now. So she, 
Thank you, Carol. Okay, good. So, Antonella, you've got some data from Hubble, whether it is an image with intensities or maybe spectra with velocities. Uh, how do you go from that to something that the printer needs? How hard is that? Well, something similar to what Tom did for Itacar. Basically, you build the data cube, or you try to build the data cube. You put all the information that you have. And, uh, for example, for NGC 602, we did quite a lot of literature search to see what was published about uh, where the various features in the cluster are spatially located to try to understand, you know, what is the truth, really, the structure of that object. So this is work in progress because it's not simple uh, and it's a combination of uh, astrophysics, things that we can measure from the images. We can measure the position of the stars. We can measure the thickness of the filaments, their intensity. We also know where they are spatially located, like the gas is towards the, the, the back end of the bubble, the dust is at the front end. But some, you know, when you want to put a visual representation out, some is also guess. Uh, uh, uh oh, I think we're overlap. Can you hear me? Still? Okay, so you cut out there toward the very, yeah, you cut out just a little bit toward, So it's hello, a, it's are you there? Can you hear me still? Can you? Uh, yes, I, we can hear you now, you dropped out just a little bit there. Okay, so it's a, it's the, Carol's showing six. Right, it's an overlap between uh, what is the data, you know, data that we have from the image, measurement from the image, data from the literature, and some guesswork in trying to put it all together. And uh, our goal also for NGC 602 is to try to do a 3D model of, of the nebula, and we'll get there, like exactly like Tom did for Itacar. Okay. So, uh, uh, Tom, do you have anything you'd like to add to that as far as the difficulty level of going from data to, uh, to a printout? Uh, yes, I would say that part of, the, uh, part of the issue, at least that we learned, was um, you can generate a 3D model that looks good on a computer screen, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can 3D print it. And there was a bit of a steep learning curve to uh, to learn what is necessary in order to have a successful to have a successful print. But we've been playing around with uh, with different software, and some of it's even freely available online. Um, one piece of software that we've started using is called uh, Blender, and uh, that allows you to do um, some very fine adjustments to the 3D mesh, or the, which which defines the geometry of your object, and it allows you to make some very nice uh, intricate changes um, to your to your mesh. Like for instance, if uh, one of the problems is your your object has to be watertight, which means for instance, if you took your model and you dipped it in water, you don't want the water to to drain out uh, or to get in, and so you have to make sure that your your model doesn't have any any obvious holes in it. And there there are some other some other uh, details that you have to make sh uh, check to make sure that your your model will print. But th that that was the that was the largest thing, and then also just the intricacies with the printers themselves. They can be they can be fickle from time to time. And uh, I'm sure that Tom agrees that there must be you know there a lot of custom made software goes into putting all together. You cannot just do this using off the shelf product. Ah, that's I what I was going to ask. So you had to write some code to do this, right? Yes, especially for the um, to 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 go from the 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 spectra from the telescope to a three D model of, of the nebula itself. Yes, that that was that was specialized. Software. Exactly. <laughs> well, what about availability? What if I wanted? What if I go out and I spend some money and I buy a printer, but I want to do this too? Can I get that software? Or are you guys going to make it available to people? Or is it something that one has to? Do themselves actually, actually, yes. So, um, so Wolfgang Stefan, who was again the, the first author on the on the Ada Car 3D modeling paper, his software is called Shape, and uh, it is it is publicly available. It is freely available, but I don't think he's still working on um, putting I think the 3D capabilities in. So, as Antonella was saying, you have to have a, a special file format usually for these printers. That's called an STL file, and I think the current version of Shape doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the capability to output that file, but from what I understand, uh, a new version that will be coming out will. 
And one of the other things that we have that we've done, especially for the um, for the for the Ada car, is in the meantime we've we've at least been trying to make the the STL files available to the public. So if they want to print their own model on their own 3D printer, or there are even companies now where you can give them a file and they will 3D print it for you if you can't afford or or have your own 3D printer. So uh, yes, so, so the goal is to try and make this as as available as we can uh, to the public, so that they can, so that they can uh, play with it themselves. Great, okay, Frank. Can you, I was just I, gonna, I was gonna, before you ask Frank a question, I was just gonna say that that it, it, it's somewhat similar, like with our visualization people here, when we are working on a press release and we have one of our animators start to work with somebody, the, the scientist has the data, and then there has to be some translation before it goes into some program like Maya or some other visualization. So, th so that step still requires, you know, artistry and science and all that. So that, that step isn't quite, you know, you just can't take, and th because, you know, that's why we do the science, is because when you take an image, you analyze it and you measure it and all that, and then you take those measurements and you put them into another file format, manipulate it, and end up with a 3D visualization or a 3D print. So that's where the science is. So there's a lot of work in getting the science right before you even you even decide to translate it into something you can manipulate on a computer or in a printer. Yeah, and and I I was particularly fascinated when Tom said that they you know they found features in Adacar that they didn't see really or they didn't even know they were there until they printed them out. One of the th and that's why I asked, is it real? And I guess that that whole step of going from the data translation to the printer file could be uh, a big source of error. But uh, it sounds like uh, everybody's being you know they got a pretty good plan for doing that translation and. Uh, I I don't know. I think this is amazing. Uh, Frank, can I just ask you real quick? Are the are the data are, are all printers more or less the same in terms of how they work uh, for input? Like if I made a file for the MakerBot, would it work on some other brand of printer? In principle, uh, it, there are certainly uh, uh, what goes to the printer is, uh, is material called G code after it comes out of the slicing tool that could be uh, could be used by uh, different printers. Um, it depends on, but there are specific commands that might be specific to the to the printer. The STL format that Tom mentioned earlier is about as universal an input as there is. Good. So that is the uh, 21st century of a parallel printer. Then <laughs> remember when you could get parallel and serial printer. Anyway, I'm never mind. Well, I, the, <laughs> the point about costs. Uh, I, I will say that the, the printer I own is uh, under $500, and their costs are, are actually pretty good. Oh, okay, great. So uh, who's got some stuff to show us? I mean, we've seen some stuff from Carol, Tom, to you, and you showed us some of the humunculi or at least one of them. Do you have any other things hand handy you could show us? Any other models? Um, at the moment, unfortunately, I, I do not. I just have um, some, some, just some smaller homunculi. <laughs> and these were, these were done. That word. I'm sorry. It cracks me up. <laughs> these, these were done on, on Frank's, on Frank's home uh, $500 printer. And they actually are, are, are quite, quite good. Um, I'm actually really impressed with with the quality that you can get out uh, of a five hundred dollar printer, especially how long did those take to make, roughly, Frank? Um, I believe an hour for the smaller ones and two hours for the larger ones. And we've okay. done it. So we've been at this for an hour. Here's the progress on our MakerBot that you've seen over the course of forty five minutes. <laughs> it's it's been it's all, it'll be going quite a while. <laughs> And once you once you get it out, though, Carol, don't you have to do something else to it after it's done? Do you have to cut well, stuff on away, the, or on these particular ones, what what? Um, so the so the ones that we showed you, which were the texture map and the elevation map, which Antonella has, um, those the elevation or the texture is is on a on a platform um, so that you can handle it. Uh, so we print. Uh, a couple millimeters thick platform, then the, the texture is on top of that. Okay. In the case of the 3D objects, the way it works, and I, um, if you look really carefully off to the right of the thing that's being printed, you'll see that it's kind of this purpley reddish material. And then as you move to the left, 
there's a darkish kind of looks like a little river. That is actually very thin, a very thin material. So the the stuff on the on the far right is a cup is a millimeter or two thick, and then the stuff that's that little river, which is around the contour that you see being printed, that little darkish region is very thin. It's like a thread thick. And so what happens when this object is finished is that part will be cracked off. And then if you're really, you know, ADD, then what you'll do is you'll polish <laughs> the edges. But in order to make the 3D object, we have to stabilize it some somehow. So most of the models that I've either pulled off the web or that we've created, we have to create some kind of platform to support the object um, especially if it's complicated, like there's this toy HST model and a couple of the pieces have additional supports that you have to break off and polish because of the way the printer works. Some of the other technology printers don't require that kind of support because it's like a gel or a powder or something and it works in a different way. But these extrusion printers that go back and forth and they lay down material, you can't kind of lay down material in space. So you need some kind of a a platform um, that will hold the material. So we're just breaking off the outer edges of the galaxies to uh, to make them usable objects. So when you made the Hubble model, did you take it in, in you made it in pieces and then glued it together, or? Well, I originally had downloaded the kit, which is a whole bunch of little connected pieces, and it, it doesn't work very well. Oh, and I okay. even scaled it up a couple times. I recently printed out the individual, which are is in the it is on the MakerBot um, web page. Uh, I did the individual pieces, and some of the pieces I had to do a couple times, like the antenna and the... the um, I was doing it for another... because somebody asked me, can we print these, and are they reasonable toys? And uh, I, I, it's difficult, because sometimes the thread gets just starts making spaghetti, because it's not adhering, or it's not enough of a surface. Um, but the main body of the telescope was fine. Yeah. Well, I know one thing. When I was a kid, I used to love to make models, and of course, all the models I made were rockets of Saturn V and Gemini and things like that. But if I, but now I don't have time to make any of that stuff. So if I had one of these, I'd just be a lazy <laughs> man. I'd, I'd be printing out rockets and stuff on mine if I had one. I already know that's what I'd do. Uh, if if I could, I'd like to elaborate a little further on what Carol was saying. Sure. Um, so the one of the the printer that we just uh, have here just got here at Goddard for for our projects. And which is which is available? It's a, it's just a consumer grade MakerBot. Is one of the ones that Frank uh, discussed, where it has two two extruders, so two nozzles. And one of the things you can do for really complicated prints, and we're doing now, is um, instead of doing like what Carol does. So if I'm correct, it looks like Carol has a single nozzle on her printer, but uh, they have what's called a hips filament. And what that is is it's a it's a special type of plastic that is dissolvable. And so what you can do is when you, you're printing these complicated structures, like Carol said, you have to have support for them. You, you have to have something for the plastic to attach to. And um, you can print, uh, so what it'll do is it'll print this uh, hips support, and then the plastic will adhere to it. And what's nice about this is then you take your model and you just uh, dip it in a, in a substance called limonene, which is pretty much just a fancy word for like citric oil or citric acid. And it's non-toxic and it's biodegradable, and it just dissolves that filament away, and you're left with your with your with your model without having to worry about uh, necessarily breaking pieces off. And right. it, it seems to work. It seems to work reasonably well. Are, are those printers more expensive, or do we do we, they're they... they're comparable to? So ours was on on the order of a, a couple thousand dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I have I I think I I met, something happened to the Q and A app when I started it today, oh, no. and, I'm not, and I'm not seeing any Q any Q and A uh, questions. But oh, Twitter dear. has got some stuff. Thank you guys for printing using Hubble Hangout. Kim Arcanda's on there. She's been make, doing a lot of great uh, tweets. Uh, uh, 3D modeling and 3D printing can be two very different beasts. That's true. I was when I made the title of this Hangout or of this event, uh, I was. I sort of took a little liberty with uh, the modeling uh, aspect of it, but I did like it is, in a sense, a model. But uh, I agree that it, it, they're not quite the same thing. So thank you for that. Um, the other, 
the uh, uh, she, uh, Alessandra Rosati is also here, and she and she tweets so cool that scientists learned that nebula had protrusions and trenches using 3D tech, and that was what uh, Tom was talking about with the uh, Ada Car Nebula that they didn't they didn't know before, um, and that is great. Uh, Kim also uh, tweets uh, textured 3D printouts have wide applicability for accessibility and for uh, education for non-experts, but also exploration for the experts. Uh, so that's a good segue into what I would like to ask you guys next. What is the future? What are you guys? What are you guys doing next, Carolyn and uh, and Antonella? What do you guys do? What do you guys got on tap for this? Go for it, Antonella. <laughs> Go for it. I think that um, you know the process, as we said, is complicated, and so. Rather than trying to make the software available, we would like to produce as many STF files as we can and make those available. So one of our big goals is to select, you know, a number of very iconic Hubble images and produce STL files for them, so that people in schools can actually, you know, print at least a texture map, an elevation map, and in some cases where the modeling is easy, maybe a 3D. Uh, object to hold in their hand. So I think that that would be uh, our way to make uh, the beautiful level images uh, accessible to more people who can't appreciate the beauty of them. Mm -hmm. I agree. That would and, and presumably these files, once we get them out, will be uh, on our website, hubblesite.org, so you'll be able to get them from there for free uh, and uh, be able to print these things out all on your own. Uh, all right, and so I, 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 I and to to leverage off of that, I, I'm hoping to convince the education and news group that that if we do come up with a reasonable process, that when a scientist um, does do a press release, that maybe we can coach them through an interface to make, uh, if appropriate, um, 3D printouts of their objects so that we can include the file on the press release and also incorporate those products into, like if you have a star formation module, you want to use 60 and its other famous clusters like NGC 3603 and stuff like that. So you can learn about star formation, you can learn about galaxies, and so integrate it into the educational products. Ah, uh, Tom Snyder is commenting. Here's a comment. Why isn't the show opening on G Plus? I had to go over to YouTube to watch. And you know something? I think something's up with G Plus today, folks. I'm sorry, and I don't because when I started it, when I started the Hangout, I also had to restart the Q and A app for some bizarre reason, and it was already queued up. So maybe there's some technical technical issues over at Google. Anyway, thanks I'm for sure over. it's Scott's fault. I agree. Scott's not here driving the internet for me. So no, it is. Uh, it, thank you for going to YouTube, Tom, and watching it instead. I do appreciate it, and I apologize for the technical issues uh, today. Nobody, not a single one of you, have talked about planets or any of that kind of stuff. Is there any way? I mean, I would like a printout of Jupiter so I could, you know, maybe see the band or feel the bands and the different. Is that possible, or is that too? Is that too? Yeah. Is spherical things not possible with these? No, no, you, it, it has been done, and there are models available. I know NASA has a site where several um, asteroids that have been modeled that have been uh, imaged. So we have these these probes that will go and orbit around various asteroids and comets and get get surface data. Um, so there are uh, 3D printable asteroids, and there is um, data from the surface of the moon, and I know that there is also data available for uh, for surface features on Mars. So that that type of thing is is possible. Oh, good. Oh, that's right. That reminds me. You could also have, like you said, features like the Vallis Marineris on Mars. Well, what, what do you got there, Carol? <laughs> Death Star? No, it's a globe. <laughs> oh, wow. No, that is really cool. At first, I thought that was a Death Star. Oh, well, okay. No, hold that up. Hold it still. Hold it still. What is that? So that is a. Well, you asked if spherical is possible. This is again on the MakerBot page. Okay. You, oh, okay. It, it has are, all kinds of those stuff. Those are like on the, the demo. Maker. Yeah, the demo you, can, you, can you can. I can show you our bracelets too. But anyway, <laughs> those guys know about bracelets because it's one of the test things that comes in the in the. It's a test module. So we love the bracelets. We have bracelets in all different colors. Yeah, I remember when you first got that printer, everybody had one. Of course, I never got one, but, you know. All right, just... all right. <laughs> ah, uh, okay, another, another Q&A on uh, uh, Kaylee, Kaylee, S, Kaylee Staxi. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, what are you guys looking forward to seeing printed on the International Space Station? Anybody want to try that? I'd love to see a homunculus printed in zero-g. <laughs> 
You and your homunculi. Yes. <laughs> By the way, if anyone's curious, homunculus means little man. That's what it, that's that's the that's the translation. Because when they, when it when you looked at it first through a uh, through a telescope, we didn't have as great optics back then, so it kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Oh, that's what it means. I was I thought it meant something really big, like I, boy, that thing is homunculus. But I guess not. Okay. Uh, so, but but to back to the comment here though, we they are doing some 3D printing in space uh, on the International Space Station. The uh, goal of which is to push the bounds of what's possible, I suppose, on these. I don't know what kind of printers they're going to have or anything like that, but if I were going to print something out on there, I would want something that is super delicate and doesn't require any, uh, you know, some, lots of little tendrils and stuff like that and that maybe you couldn't print here in space, but unfortunately... I, I think don't know they're printing parts, space. but remember, we're having a hangout on that. Well, I was hoping you would you would plug that. Yeah. We are having a hangout with those. We guys. are, we are. In the future, we have we have a hangout plan with the Made in Space guys. So uh, that will be coming up in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that, guys. Uh, okay, couple. Uh, one more comment on Twitter. Uh, Alessandra Rosati is also tweeting. Really cool to know that the Hubble telescope is working with people who are visually impaired using 3D technology. And with that, I am going to say. Yes, I agree. That is, it is really cool, and uh, it is only the beginning, as everybody here in this panel has pointed out. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thanks to, thanks to Tom Madura, uh, Frank Frank Reddy, Antonella Nota, and Carol Christian. I'm driving the internet, guys, which is why you're seeing all these clickies going by <laughs> really fast. Because I don't have, I just click on stuff. I don't pay attention. Um, <laughs> next week is uh, our Hubble Hangout will feature not Hubble but the James Webb Space Telescope. We will be talking with members of Northrop Grumman team and NASA Goddard to give an update on the James Webb Space Telescope and the deployment test that has recently happened so we hope you guys will check in with us there. Thank you all for commenting and uh, Lee, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties on Google Plus but I thank you for your patience and as always thank you for watching and keep Looking up. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Tel I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and today we have a really interesting uh, and I think really unique uh, hangout planned for you today because uh, we're going to be talking about modeling the universe using 3D printers, and we've got people using Hubble data and other astronomical data sources to create these really cool uh, objects from 3D printers, and they're using them for all kinds of different things. Uh, for example, they're using them for uh, helping to educate the visually impaired, but they're also using, they're also finding things out about these objects, about the various astronomical objects uh, in the printers that we may not be able to ordinarily see from the um, from just the 3D renderings of the images themselves. So really interesting stuff planned. I got a lot of people here from both the Institute and NASA Goddard, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. But before I do, let me tell you how to interact with us. The easiest way is to hit the Q&A app on the, on the uh, event page or on the video that you're watching. Send us a question or a comment. I'll read them out as the, as the Hangout progresses. Alternatively, you can comment on the YouTube page. I'm looking at those comments as well. You could use the G Plus event page, and last and not and but not least, although it is least because nobody ever seems to do it, please tweet at us using the hashtag Hubble Hangout, and we will. All, I'm also looking at those right now. So if you have a question or comment you'd like to send on Twitter, please do it that way. So with me today is, as she always is every single week, to explain some of the com complexity of our prototype image. If yes. That's okay. No, that is fine. But before we start, I just want to—I okay. want to—I want to have uh, the, the the NASA Goddard uh, folks yeah, tell us sure. a little bit, of, introduce the, their stuff sure. a little bit. Uh, Tom, Absolutely. can you give us a little? Uh, what can you add anything to that? What are you guys doing at Goddard that maybe parallels or or augments what what Carol was just saying? Yes. So uh, here at Goddard, the, our first project actually did not use uh, Hubble data. Um, we used data from the uh, very large telescope in Chile. And the thing that we modeled was the uh, the Eta Carina Homunculus Nebula, and okay. Um, okay. this is just a a three D three D print model of that. And we okay. had a uh, press release come out. But we also are working on some uh, 
some HST data, but that is um, that is some work work in progress at the moment. Okay, so uh, so both of you, both of your groups, it sounds like you're trying to get people to visualize data in a slightly different way. We're getting away from images a little bit using these technologies. Uh, Carol, um, so I'm going to go ahead and just give a quick cutaway to the printer that's working in your office. If you look okay. behind, if you look behind Carol over her shoulder, you can see there's this arm moving back and forth, and here's a close up of it. Here's the 3D printer uh, working right now, and right now you're printing something out, right, Carol? Right now, yes, we're actually printing a 3D galaxy, um, which is our second phase of our, our project, um, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, we thought we might talk a little bit about where we started, which was... Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute, but now, while she ordinarily helps me moderate these things, today she's going to be more of a guest because she's part of the project that we're going to highlight today. Hi, Carol. And don't forget that she, we, we have her muted, so she's going to be muting and unmuting throughout the whole thing. They would mostly like me to be quiet. So <laughs> yes, we try as hard as we can, mostly but we're not always very successful. Mute, so. <laughs> we're not always very successful in muting. Also with, with us today is Dr. Antonella Nota. She's also uh, at the Institute, but I, I see that you also work at, uh, at ESA, right? The European Space Agency, is that right? Yes, I'm part uh, of the international contingent of you know, Right, there are uh, some people within the institute yes. from ESA working on Hubble. So, Absolutely. welcome, welcome, Hi. and she's also part. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, and joining us also is uh, 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 Thomas uh, Madera, I believe is the last name. Is where did Madera? your where third go? Uh, did... <laughs> yeah, that's weird. It should be showing, but it's not showing. It says it's on. Oh, okay. All right. He's also from NASA Goddard, part of the 3D printing project. Uh, welcome, as well as uh, Frank Reddy, from the, also from NASA Goddard. Uh, he's a science writer, and um, I should mention Tom is also an astrophysicist. It's not up there on his lower third, but it, it, or it is up on his lower third, but his lower third is not up. So anyway, welcome, guys. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. I think I'd like to start with you, Carol. Can you give us a sort of overview of I the yeah. to make um, texture maps and elevation maps of star clusters, and and Antonella okay. actually has some of those products. I can show the image, and then she can she can talk about it because okay. she's an expert at it. Okay, so I'm going to try to screen share here, folks. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, there's a little. So let me know if. We are sharing. We should be sharing now. Yep, we see. And then I will bring in the image so that everybody can see the image. So there it is. Ah, NGC 602. So Antonella can talk about so this. So is, this is NGC 602, which is a beautiful cluster in the small Magellanic Cloud. And uh, when we saw this image, we thought this is a great image to convey the basic science behind our cluster form and evolve. And so just to think how to explain this image to people who cannot appreciate the beauty, uh, we thought to distill a couple of messages. What are the things that the fundamental concept that we want to convey, right? There is a star cluster at the center, just newly formed, and the star cluster has very massive stars, and the massive stars are swept away, the cocoon of gas and dust, and you can still see the filaments around, the sort of uh, bubble-shaped shell, and you can see small stars still forming around. So this is a region, dense in gas and dust, with stars at the center. 3D printing project. What are you guys? Uh, what are you guys doing? What are you hoping to accomplish? Things like that. Sure. Um, so our project, which is called 3D Astronomy, I mean, I meant 3D Astronomy. I said 3D. 3D Astronomy is based on Hubble Space, specifically Hubble Space Telescope data, and um, we, as many people know, we have a very large education outreach program associated with the Hubble Space Telescope, but there are some groups of people that um, we can't reach easily. And so we've been thinking about and starting to work on a, a, a suite of products that for the visually impaired, and, but also are beneficial for people who learn in different ways. And so we have been thinking about the beautiful images from HST and how can we share those with the visually impaired. And we have, we have collaborators who have done some work in making tactile imagery 
so that people can understand the complexity and beauty of Hubble Space Telescope images and then also understanding the underlying science. And so that's basically the idea was to use 3D printing to create tactile models that people can use their fingers to explore imagery rather than um, using their eyes. And so our challenge is to try to represent the complexity of the images. And if you don't mind, I was going to show an image. And actually, Antonella, who's the science PI of this project, might be 